Even with President Trump in Asia, there was no shortage of political stories here at home. As voters took to the polls in several states, an Alabama Senate candidate became embroiled in a sexual scandal, and Republican senators revealed details of a tax plan they see as a must-pass. And to the analysis of Shields and Brooks, that syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Welcome, gentlemen, and what a difference 24 hours makes um, when it comes to Roy Moore. Uh, David Brooks, uh, we, we didn't know about this, I guess, uh, a little more than 24 hours ago. Now we do. Uh, these accusations that he, as a young man of in his early 30s, uh, was with uh, several young women, including one 14 years old. He today is denying all this. He says it's a political smear. But just in the last hour, we've learned that two Republican senators have withdrawn their endorsement, Mike Lee of Utah, uh, Steve Daines of Montana. Can he survive this? I don't think so. Not. I don't think he can be seated. Uh, he can survive. I mean, it, you think you've lost your capacity to be disgusted by by what goes on in this country. Uh, and this, it should be said first, is a very credible, well-sourced story. The people were not did not come out of the woodwork. The the women who were the accusers were pulled out and, and interviewed and finally consented to give their stories. Uh, so it seems to be quite a credible story. Uh, and what's disgusting is not only his behavior, uh, alleged behavior in those instances, but the actual actual behavior of a lot of Republicans in Alabama these days who are either casting it off as no big deal or giving the excuse, well, uh, in the Bible, J Joseph and Mary had a relationship and Mary was a teenager. Uh, one doesn't even know where to begin, <laughs> that kind of excuse. And so suddenly uh, this sort of stuff is tolerated because our party has to win and beat the other party. Uh, and so this is the ultimate test of conscience for the Republican Party. Most of the Washington Republican Party, uh, Republicans are passing that test. But in Alabama, maybe not. And maybe they can keep them in the race. It is the case, Mark. Most Alabama Republicans are defending him. Now, the governor, uh, we heard her a few minutes ago, she is saying uh, mm -hmm. what, what these allegations are. They seem credible. They seem credible. And Richard Shelby, uh, the senior Republican senator from, uh, from Alabama, uh, uncharacteristically came to the microphone yesterday to address them as serious charges um, and was part of the chorus uh, of Republican senators uh, who uh, was, was certainly quite serious about uh, the Washington Post story and treated it seriously and suggested that uh, Roy Moore would be better leaving. Um, but I, I, I think, Judy, when, when you look at this, it, uh, it, it just stands as a stark contrast to what's happened. David said our team versus the other team, how deeply that has changed in just six or seven years. I, there was a congressman from New York named Chris Lee. He was a Republican congressman uh, and uh, in a safe Republican district upstate. And he was, he was exposed as showing a bare, uh, above-the-waist photo of himself online to a woman he had met on Craigslist uh, and passing himself off as a 39-year-old divorced lobbyist instead of a married congressman. One hour later, one hour later, after meeting with John Boehner, he resigned from the Congress. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was, that was, there was a sense then that that was wrong. It was unacceptable. Um, these same Republicans uh, who are now springing to his defense, especially the conservatives in the press, uh, it rightly went after Anthony Weiner. Uh, for sexting and sending sexual materials overline to women, uh, teenagers, inappropriately, illegally, and he's paying for it. Um, never once did he uh, allegedly touch any of them or undress any of them or take them to his apartment. Uh, and that's what Roy Moore, these are serious. And today, we went from fake news yesterday from Roy Moore to today, I didn't generally, as a 30-something attorney, date teenagers. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I, I just think, I think this thing is headed very south in a, in a big hurry for the Republicans in a bad way. Do you see this as a test somehow for Republicans, David? Yeah, I think it's a test uh, for Republicans, especially in this regard. 
This is a predicate for what, when, if Bob Mueller comes with charges to Donald Trump, he's going to say fake news, fake news, fake news. And that's more or less what a, a lot of people in the Trumpian movement are doing. No fact is fact. A fact they don't like is just fake news. And if the Washington Post, with a very well-sourced story, can't be believed and can be just dismissed as fake news, then everything can be dismissed as fake news. And we've lost all sense of, of reality, basically. And so I think, you know, the party, not only to behavior about harassment, has to show some spine, but on the, the basic respect for truth, if, you, if we can't have some basic respect for evidence, we really do not have a democracy, and that's what's ultimately at, at stake here. And that's, that brings up, Mark, what so much else of what we've seen in the political uh, climate of the last year and it, more. No, it, it does, and the, the, the charge, I think David makes a good point and a solid point. I mean, we have to have and agreed upon to have any kind of a debate and dialogue in a democracy, we have to agree on facts. And um, that if, 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 if something comes from a source that I don't like, I just can't reject it. If in fact, and and this is this is a, a well sourced story uh, by the uh, by the Washington Post, and uh, it it is uh, you know it's it's serious. And I, as we I think we reported a few minutes ago too, the Post also reported the woman who made these, uh, the one who was 14 years old yes. at the time. Uh, the Post has reported she voted Republican in the last few elections, voted for Donald Trump. So yeah. you know it, it's harder to make the case that this is uh, this, this is this a democratic is, yep. smear. So so David, I guess you could argue. This has not been a good week for Republicans. Looking back to the Tuesday elections uh, across the country, but mainly those governor's races in New Jersey and especially uh, in Virginia, um, it, what are the what's the lesson of Republicans to take from this? Because we're hearing different analyses of this. Yeah, I, I take the maximalist position. You know, when you have an unpopular president, of course, his party is more likely to lose elections, uh, you know, in, in an off-term election. But this, to me, is much deeper. We're in a moment of historic transitions. The fundamental tectonics are changing in our um, in our politics. And to me, the, fun, the two big things that happened, in the, especially the Virginia race, was that it used to be on the outer rings of a lot of suburbs, you had a lot of people who worked in office parks, who worked for corporations, generally pro-capitalists. They tend to be Republican. Uh, and this time, those sorts of people voted for the Democrats by tremendous majorities. There's a county out, one of the fastest and richest growing counties in the country called Loudoun County, which is out past Dulles Airport. That was a pro-Bush, County, it went for the Democrats this time 60 to 40 by landslide pr proportions. And that's, that's going to happen all around the country. And that's just devastating for Republicans around the country. The second thing that leapt out at me was the youth vote. Uh, young people under 28 voted for the Democrats 69 to 30. That's, that's a gigantic proportion, 28 to 44, almost as big a proportion. So you're basically losing the future by epic proportions. And, and what the Republican Party has done, if this continues, is they've basically shrunk their coalition to an unsustainable size in a lot of states. How do you look at the Tuesday results? Uh, let me just add two things to David's uh, diagnosis, which I found penetrating and perceptive. Um, and, and, <laughs> That's and, and, a compliment, and, and, I think. Yes, it is. I, I, about after eight months, I thought I should give him one. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I think, Judy, when anybody wins a national election the way Ron, Donald Trump did, I mean, it was a unique form. Nobody had ever won that way before. And everybody in politics kind of looked and they were, they were nervous. They said, is this the new form? I mean, do you have to be bombastic? I mean, do you have to use locker room or, or bar room language and, and, and engage in feuds? And that you got to be that kind of colorful and dominate the news constantly. The man who won in Virginia was the ultimate non-Trump. Ralph Northam, is a, is a physician, eight years, VMI graduate, Virginia Military Institute, eight years in the Army, married to Pam, a, an elementary school teacher, uh, colorless. Said he voted uh, for George Bush. Uh, jo voted for George Bush, non-bombastic um, and earnest. And uh, he won a bigger, he won by a margin three times larger than Barack Obama carried Virginia. I mean, it was, it was that impressive. And he won across the board. So I think when you look at the Virginia results, there's one number that jumps out. The, the, the Democrats, it has become a blue state. The Democrats have not lost a statewide election in Virginia since 2009. That's across the board at, at all the constitutional offices and, and president and Senate. But 
the Republicans, because they won in 2009 and controlled the redistricting process, drew the legislature seats, gerrymandered so there were 66 Republican seats and 34 Democrats. On last Tuesday, the Democrats went in and they won at least 15, and maybe, and there's still three to be decided, they may have won a majority. So they took that many seats away from seats that have been drawn for Republicans. That was because D was next to their name and R was next to the Republican name. That was Trump. That was energy, it was passion and all the rest and good, good people. But I mean, it really reflected that, that Donald Trump had become an albatross. Well, Republican candidate. well, speaking of that, David, I mean, the White House and Steve Bannon, their former chief strategist, are saying the mistake that Ed Gillespie, the Republican, made was not embracing Donald Trump enough. That was what the president himself said. He didn't embrace me enough. Uh, so what, what's the message for Republican candidates this year? Yeah, well, they weren't watching the campaign, I believe. They're, they're essentially arguing that Ed Gillespie would have won if he'd had even more commercials about the Confederate statues. He would have won college-educated women voters if he'd emphasized the MS-13 gang even more. Uh, it's just not plausible. Uh, he, the, uh, he ran a pretty Trumpian campaign. It was, uh, it was all over the press. And in the days when he, in the final days where it seemed, seemed to be gaining, the story from Bannon World was that he was embracing Trump, and it's totally uh, a winning strategy. So again, they sort Sort of dump people who are losers pretty fast. I would issue one word of caution. The Republicans are shrinking, but it, are we necessarily in for an era of Democratic dominance? I think it is worth pointing out that I, I do think that they had a good candidate or moderately good candidate, but this was not a, dem, a victory the Democrats earned. This was the Republicans handing them a big slice of the electorate. And to me, the, what signif what's happened because of these elections is the most interesting story in politics is not what the Republicans are doing, it's how the Democrats react to this opportunity? Do they become a party that expends outward and seizes the ground that the Republicans are seedingly, seemingly seeding them, or do they retreat and just go back to their base? What you're seeing around the world is not left-wing dominance, it's the collapse of all parties. And we could begin to see that, too. How do you think Democrats are going to respond? To I, I, well, I, I, hope, I hope that they don't start imposing litmus tests. I hope that they believe in coalition politics. If we agree, 80 percent of us, that, we, that then that's all you really need to be a political party. You can see the signs from people like Tom Steyer, the, uh, the billionaire environmentalist, who's imposing, uh, you have to believe this, and if you don't believe that, or you don't believe, you, you know, universal national payer uh, calling health insurance. Calling for the impeachment of yeah, the president. Calling for the impeachment of the president. Presidency, calling that you have to be totally, absolutely pro-choice without any qualms. I mean, the, the, the fact is, Judy, that the Democrats do have an opportunity, and, and they had a great victory. The Republicans have retreated. The Republicans in Virginia are on the verge of becoming like the Republicans in California, a party that is unwelcoming and, un, and openly hostile to people who aren't white. And it, you've seen what it's happened. And, but I, I will say this. There are 9.2 million Americans who voted in 2016 for Donald Trump, who had voted for Barack Obama. And the Democrats have to address and speak to these people, to their anxieties, to their economic stagnation, and, and to, to their well-being, and not, not simply play to the, the, the people who are disaffected and by, from Donald Trump right now. And just quickly, David, are Democrats doing that yet? Are they doing it at all? And uh, not, not so much. I think the party, if you look at the fundamentals, uh, the pub, how, how they think about the world, the Democratic Party has shifted very sharply to the left. In fact, they're further left than their policies have. So one would expect the, the shift to the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren direction to continue. And that will be a challenge for a lot of people who are living in that Loudoun County I mentioned. Democrats doing what you think? I, I think I, mean, I think the test is coming in, in 2018. I mean, yeah. in, in the recruitment of candidates, I'd have to say they're doing a good job. And they did a good job in in Virginia to find candidates who match and are comfortable and congenial with the voters they're seeking to represent. One shout out, Tom Perriello, who lost the Democratic primary to Ralph Northam, former congressman, uh, was the liberal alternative to Northam in the primary, could have sulked, could have gone away. He spent all his time, effort, and energy working with those legislative candidates, recruiting them, helping them. And if helping the Democrats are the majority, uh, he deserves a little credit. I'm going to give both of you credit. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you both.